Thanks to the organizers for having me. Thank you all. Thanks to you all for staying to the bitter end. And I was trying to decide if this means I should be more obnoxious than usual or uh, or be more refined since I'm supposed to somehow summarize things, but we we'll decide as we go along. So, uh, um, well, there's a title. And if you don't know what those words means, hopefully I will explain that throughout the talk. And uh, I'll explain a little more detail what we did in these papers, but the main bulk of the talk is on a couple of recent papers with Lee Zek, who's a student at Oxford. And uh, then there's a very long paper with uh, Dave Mason and Roger Mong that I'll touch on too. So um, the overall message, I guess, of my talk, maybe, well, uh, the conference has a lot of things, um, is that fusion categories provide a valuable tool for lattice statistical mechanics. So, no, so this, uh, yeah, and uh, so we, we saw this beautiful uh, graph the other day that uh, Dave wrote, that credited to Colleen, and um, talked about the history, well, or something history or a little taxonomy of this field. And so since we're doing topological quantum computation here, at least allegedly, I would guess, and people, someone object with me if, if this is wrong, but uh, I would guess most people in this room think of the story beginning with Von Jones' <laughs> paper on not invariance. Maybe well, you can disagree with me on that, but I think most people would say that's where the story started. But if you look at Vaughn's paper, this one, um, you'll, you'll see at the very end, there's a, a thank to Di Evans, who many of you know, and he knows that actually a key thing that Vaughn used, something we now call the temporally lead algebra, was discovered long before, um, 13, 14 years before uh, Va Vaughn did, and uh, notes this, and it's, notice there's this key word in there, is statistical mechanics up there, and and so you all know what the temporal algebra I think, I expect everyone knows the temporal algebra is. I'm not going to use it, um, except inspirationally. But uh, but many people, again, based on my past experience, don't know what temporal and leap were actually doing at the time and why they wrote down this algebra that Vaughn then really rediscovered and, and used to spectacular effect. But there's something also that's not known. So at the same time, Vaughn did his work in the uh, mid to late 80s. Um, actually starting in the early 80s, but then going throughout the 80s, there's all this spectacular work that came out of the STATMEC community, um, among the things you've heard of, quantum group algebras, conformal field theory, and all these things uh, allowed the uh, development of fusion categories and very much fed in, so not just one, but all this other stuff. So then I decided to make a slide. So yesterday, uh, Dave drew the slide, which he created Colleen, so I'll call his thing, uh, the thing he talked about, Colleen's the Delaney diagram. I'm not going to reproduce it, but here's my version of what led up uh, to that and some, some of the things that I'll talk about today. So for me, the kind of uh, core of it, and, and certainly in the talk today, is 2D classical lattice models. If you don't know what they are, I'll, again, I'll try and explain uh, to people who don't know what, what those are. That's that's uh, many of you all, which is not me, but the mathematics, there's people studying subfactors and finding all these nice things about that. Okay, so what happened on this side was, okay, well, th this thing known for a long time, and I'll mainly discuss quantum spin chains, uh, later renamed Enion chains. Um, uh, and those come from a limit. That's why I think this is a better, more general way of thinking about it. Um, and so I'll, I'll again explain this in more detail, what went on. Um, a temporally leap came up with an algebraic description of these classical lattice models. And simultaneously, great papers often uh, come around the same time doing seemingly different things. Uh, for two in Castelline, that's the FK, did a graphical description of the same lattice models that I'll discuss in a little more detail. Um, again, subfactors were doing lots of nice things at the same time. But then Vaughn wrote his paper coming out of the subfactor community, um, but then recognizing, as in the uh, end comment in his paper, that they were coming to the same place. And then this spectacular um, story of not Lincoln variants. But then uh, I'm going to stand in the middle here. The uh, All right. So then other things happened coming out of the stat mech community also coming out of the string theory community, conformal field theory that comes if you take a continuum limit of some of these models. Um, another story I mentioned quickly before, the quantum group story, which came very much out of the algebraic description of lattice models and then uh, Uber 
And Vincent Pasquier wrote a famous paper explaining how quantum groups could say all sorts of interesting things about quantum spin chains. Um, and then and only then, <laughs> of all these things merged, I think, on uh, the story of fusion categories, a really crucial paper to me, that the one central paper that really led, in my opinion, disagree again, if you like, but to fusion categories, this is a spectacular paper by Morin Seiberg that very much came out of conformal field theory, but noticing very much all the other things that were going on and, and trying to bring that together. And that, that was, to me, um, really the story. And of course, lots of people um, uh, who you know better than I do. So that's why I decided I would invariably neglect someone. So lots of important developments came in coming from the math side. So um, yeah, the rest is history. And that's this. So then you have to go back to Colleen's diagram um, to see that. So um, what, so what I'm going to focus on today is three bits of this diagram, the, the 2D, well, two, three and a half. So the 2D classical lattice models and their quantum spin chain limits. And then this algebraic description, a la temporally leap, um, and then fusion categories. But today, um, I'm, I'm going to reverse <laughs> the usual arrow I'm, I'm in something that really hasn't been done, I think, that much, or at least not been done for a long time, which is to say, OK, we now in the last 30 or so years, we've learned a lot of mathematics. Um, you've learned a lot of mathematics about fusion categories and all these um, wonderful uh, structures that exist in these things, but there's not hasn't been, in my opinion, a lot of work um, to to use that now and say, can we say something new about these models? Not just what Temperley and Lieb said now, more than fifty years ago. Um, and so, yeah, they ask, you know, I, I want um, fusion categories. So I'm I'm not going to say anything new about fusion categories in and of themselves, but maybe uh, the application of them to some physics problems might be new. Um, and so here, more precisely, is the thing that, that uh, I'm going to do. Um, I want to use, use these things to construct topological defects. And mostly on the lattice, today, uh, today is all lattice, but lots of work has been done by other people on continuum stuff. And so let me schematically, again, I, I promise later on, for those of you who aren't familiar with the details, uh, I will provide at least some uh, very concrete things, but I want to try and keep it schematic for a bit just to give you the idea. Um, and so so you in StatMap, we like to compute this thing called the partition function. Again, I'll explain that to you if you don't like, but it's just, if you don't know what that is, substitute physical properties in the presence of topological defects. So these are defects in actual space. Um, and and uh, w w why it's called a topological defect is you compute these things and it's independent of any deformations of the defects. And why topological, though, says, of course, of course if you wrap it around cycles of a torus or whatever manifold you want, um, then things do change. And also these defects can branch and fuse and all this stuff. But if you think about now a uh, physicist for a second, so the way we like to do things, if it's a quantum system, we think in space time, and then the Hamiltonian is an operator that revolves you in time. So say, we'll take up to be time. In classical Stabenek, we use an object called the transfer matrix. I'll define it later on. But again, it uses it to basically you build up space uh, sort of one a layer at a time. Then you think about, well, if, if, if the physics doesn't depend on the deformations of these things, well, then it has to commute with these operators that you define on some vector space or Hilbert space in a quantum theory. And so these are like symmetries. But as I'll try and explain in detail, these aren't the usual symmetries you learn about when you when physics grad students are taught about quantum mechanics, you know, which are typically unitary and nice and Lie groups and all sorts of uh, beautiful thing. Um, the, the, the currently fashionable as of this year buzzword for these things is non-invertible, which is one of the key properties of many of these things. So you act twice and you don't get back <laughs> to where you for, for certain kinds of dualities. That's why put quotes on dualities. You act twice, twice, but you're not back where you started. That's the current buzzword. It's a good one. It, it's, it's very evocative. Sometimes people use non-invertible symmetries for things that actually are invertible, but you know, whatever. It's the bright idea. Categorical is one. That's, I think, maybe the best one, but there's presumably things like this. So in fact, what Hubert talked about those may be categorical symmetries, but certainly not the way he formulated it. Maybe they could be, but that's not quite. And, and then there's the cop-out word, just generalized, um, but which of course works, but isn't so useful. Um, 
And so the canonical example of this, and I, I never tire of trying to tell string theorists this, you know, is string theorists, um, well, all right, I'm, I'm being recorded. Um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, the, the really canonical example of this, uh, of, of all these things, despite what you may hear elsewhere, um, is something that's called Kramer's 1A duality, and it came from a lattice statistical mechanical problem. Many of you know what it is, but I just say in words, well, there's what the authors said in words. Um, basically, they have, it's a spin system, spins are up or down, and, you know, at low temperature, they like to align, at high temperature, they don't align. But they observed that if you do certain computations, this partition function, there's an equality between well, an equality between the partition function at low temperature and one at high temperature. And they said they already hedged, I mean, you said duality, but low temperature is very different from high temperatures. That's why they called it a symmetry property because they grapple it. So everything they did was perfect, but they were trying to grapple with what this exactly means. And so in other things, they lets you locate the critical temperature exactly without doing any more calculations. And another remarkable thing about this paper, which I learned when making, uh, well, the first version of this talk, you look at the things, you know, Cromers was in Leiden and Wani, I was in Texas already. Collaborations were difficult to cross an ocean in 1941, no, no Zoom. But um, uh, Leiden, uh, Holland was under Nazi occupation at that point. So the uh, U.S. wasn't in the war yet, but I'm still to carry on a collaboration with someone under Nazi occupation. And for Cromers that way to do quality science uh, in that environment is even more mind blowing that, that you know, uh, 80, 82 years later, I'm showing this paper on a slide. It's just such a remarkable story. Anyway, so that's the story, and um, and for there there were generalizations of what Kramer's and Wine did to other models, but it's basically the same duality more or less. Um, but only recently, I'd say in the last fifteen years, <laughs> have we learned really non-trivial ways of generalizing what Kramer's wanted to do. So where stuff that that would have been a big surprise to them, I think other things they would shrug. Yeah, okay, I see it works out for other models. And the key to doing this was fusion categories. And for this isn't really an integral conference, but some of you know something about it. And something I want to emphasize: you can derive exact results in non-integral models, which is for a really remarkable thing. All right, so yeah, to, uh, oh, so I'm going to progressively get uh, more concrete as we go on. I thought I'd just do one more uh, uh, sort of vague slide, and and yeah, to so anyway. So you know, I, I I you can give this talk in two ways, and obviously you can guess the way I'm going to do it. But the, the 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 style that many of you do, and even I do sometimes, is. Uh, you know, you, you pick some general structure, fusion categories and topological defects, and you say, all right, here's how we do it. And that's what we did in the paper I wrote with Dave and Roger. Um, you know, we start with try your Barrett Westbury theory. If you know what it is, you hopefully you listened to the previous talk and learned. Um, and uh, and so you start with that, and then there's this beautiful construction that, that we did. I guess I can call it beautiful. Credit Dave and Roger. Um so you draw a picture. So basically you compute all the things you need to know for topological defects in a 2D classical lattice model can all come by doing the TVBW state sums. And you can compute all the things you need to know from there. And then you know automatically it has to work. Now I'm a physicist, so it, that just, when people tell me it automatically has to work, I, I want to believe them, but uh, the only, way I know to really believe that physics literature is uh, not uh, not known for its truth on many occasions. <laughs> and um, so the physics style, of course, is you work out some examples, you check that they all work out, and then and only then when you see how the, the sort of works, um, then you trust the mathematicians that, okay, yeah, it works. So in this case, it does. And um, obviously in this talk, I'll more use the second style um, with only a few comments there. And so what I'm going to do today in particular, that's what I said, we'll focus mostly on um, the paper with Louisa, um, although I'll get back to that a bit, um, is I'm, I'm going to handle the quartet of spin chains and then show how this gives you exact results. Uh, and uh, to justify my existence as a physicist even more, um, the, one of the models I focus on turns out to be really interesting in its own right. So that's one of the nice things about uh, really 
low, lowering yourself to into the trenches sometimes you uh, really get some useful stuff out okay so uh again uh slightly more uh, vague but this this is my apology slide um so in usual talks and so usually in uh, when i give this talk i'm giving it to Condensed matter people, so I have to apologize for doing formalism and say, well, you know, uh, yeah, I had to learn about fusion categories, but you know, they're really useful, and you know, and I'll show you some, show you some phase diagram plots to justify it. And they don't usually believe me, but you know, they at least tolerate me. Um, and I gave this talk to string theorists, and I had to do the opposite apology for actually mentioning experiments in in the talk. So <laughs> this is the one conference I think I I, I can at least not for years. So I've been to a conference where both experiments and mathematics have been mentioned in maybe not quite equal quantities, but substantial quantities. So I don't know apologies, but I still use the same slide. <laughs> and uh, so let me tell you a little bit about the physics that. Uh, that comes in and I'll get back to that at the end. So I uh, so yeah, I don't think I'm gonna say anything about quantum simulators. And I'll try and explain what that means. So there's the Rydberg atom arrays. So I'm not going to tell you how the experiments get there. But what it does enable you to do is provide a genuine experimental platform to do some strongly interacting physics. And the thing all uh, the kind of mod the model specific model I, I'll, I'll get to um, is use. Rydberg blockade. Again, you don't have to know what those words means, except for the following fact. It means that you have a two-state quantum system, a bunch of two-state quantum systems. They can make in any array. The experimentalists are better than the theorists. They can do two dimensions easily and all this. And each side, it's a two-state system, but there's a it, they can tune interactions. And what they do, because it's a it will, it's possible for them and makes it already just makes interesting theoretical problems is forbid say nearest neighbors to be occupied or they can tune even longer you can make next nearest neighbors be occupied so you have two state systems but the hilbert space is effectively reduced in size because you don't allow two spins to, in, the, in the spin language two spin two up spins can't be next to each other two downs so instead of thinking of up and down think of terms empty and occupied and so you can allow as many empty sites can be wherever, but you can't have two occupied sites on this together. And that's the Rydberg blockade. And they really do this. And in fact, they already there was there was a really fascinating formal thing that was discovered experimentally. This happens in physics, where the experimentalists discover something interesting theoretically before the theorists, and it goes in the name of quantum scars. And there's a whole nice story. There's people from Leeds here. The, many in some ways the story the theoretical story interested there so that that's a whole fascinating story there's lots i could say about that but good but that's that's to provide motivation and and lucan and his experimental group at harvard coined the term quantum simulators because we're not doing computations we're not cracking rsa or anything like that but what we are doing is tunable ways of studying quantum systems so you can realize your favorite physics some of your favorite <laughs> physics models in the lab in a much more controllable thing as opposed to having to deal with detailed properties of materials. Doesn't mean material science is obsolete, but it's another it's another way in to theoretical physics. You you could pick pick a model and maybe they can uh, simulate. It. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is this Rydberg blockade. So we have particles. One of the things I want to talk about. So these particles again, two state system, either empty or occupied, but we're on a, on a ladder, on a square ladder. And um, the, the technique I'm going to use is these non-invertible symmetries. And what we're going to do is we're going to relate a particular one of model of this. I'll, I'll write it down it's, uh, later. Um, but relate to a very famous model of statistical mechanics that uh, maybe isn't is, is about as understood as you can get in statistical mechanics. This is what's called the XXC spin chain. Um, we then can go on beyond this. And I'm not going to have time to probably to get that today. And then um, so... There's a whole big phase diagram we have. I'll flash it, but I won't be able to describe it. Okay, so here's the detailed outline, most of which I've said already. What I'm going to do, again, back, harken back to temporally leave and take the XXC chain. I'll tell you what it is if you don't know, and write in terms of an algebra, a la temporally leave, but not temporally leave. And then using this algebra, I find four different Hamiltonians, all of which end up being integral, integrable, and um, with lots of physics, including this Rydberg. <laughs> And then, uh, and then I'll describe ways to map in between them using these non-invertible 
dual, quote, dualities. So these models will be related by this. And also uh, the you get symmetry. So they don't map a model to something else. They map a model to itself, but they're this non-invertible symmetry. And in the end, I'll, I'll, if I have a few minutes, I'll mumble about what this tells you about the physics. Okay. So that's the outline. All right, so let me now at least start by telling you what Temper and Lieb did, if you didn't know already. So that's their 1971 paper that uh, that uh, where they wrote down the algebra. So okay, so you look at so key keywords here. First word in the title: relations between. And there's a bunch of models. The StatMec people, you know, what these models are. You probably don't, but for today, it doesn't really matter. See, there's ones. They're, they're called various <laughs> things. They've come up in the literature. Uh, all sorts of models that people had been studying. And so um, Temper and Lieb showed them. And one key thing they even knew at the beginning, they already noticed the relation between spin models and graphical models. So already the seeds of Jones are already there. And this paper that I'm, I, I just mentioned briefly, and I'll mention briefly again by Fortune and Castelline made that much more explicit, <laughs> explaining how these local models were related to cluster models and Lieb models. So that was all done in 1971. It was a good year for theoretical physics. And so that's what they were doing. But let me try and say more precisely. So what they did is they took a transfer matrix of a model. Um, that's a way, again, to build up uh, space space or space time by acting um, for one shot at a time. And so the key thing is, is an operator on some vector space. In a quantum system, that would be the Hilbert space. And for a classical system, it's more or less the same. You don't need the inner product, but it doesn't matter. You got a vector space and some operator. But what they did is instead of just writing it down as some explicit operator like physicists like to do, they said, well, they started with one particular operator, but they said, let's rewrite this operator in terms of an algebra satisfying certain relations. Um, and so obviously, we, in a sense, we do that with poly matrices, you can do that, but they did something even a little more general. They defined an algebra that their operator thinks, and that's the temporally leave algebra. But then they noticed they could write other models in the same fashion. In other words, they, they took another model, completely different, even a completely different Hilbert space and completely different operators. But when you wrote them in the right way, you saw that the generators, you, you could define an algebra whose generator satisfied exactly the same relation, the temporally Lieb algebra. And then they call, they they often use the word equivalent. It's not, that's not quite right. What it really means when you can do this, you can derive linear maps in between the partition function of these models. So it, quote equivalent is okay. They're, they're closely related bonds. And I, again, I'll try and explain what quote equivalents mean as the talk goes on. And then now you all know the term Bleville algebra also has something to do with the Jones polynomial. And I should say, please interrupt, otherwise I talk too much. So I've talked too fast. And then you, again, in this room, the, pretty much everybody, probably everybody knows the this, this story of what happened subsequently, which is that uh, you gen uh, many generalizations are known, whole fusion category thing. One particularly famous one, take a simple Lie algebra and a positive integer, this is called G level K. This is a certain set of fusion categories. It's a certain set of conformal field theories. It's also closely related to certain sets of lattice models. And so um, all sorts of nice things that people did. Um, and I'm gonna focus on one, which, is, you know, so in a sense, it was known but I think what wasn't uh, at least it wasn't widely appreciated of how special it is. So before I tell you what category it is, let me write down as promised what the XXE chain is for those who haven't seen this before. Okay, so we got a Hilbert space, a bunch of two state systems, not doing the Rydberg blockade, hold that for a moment. So just two state systems. So there's Hilbert spaces dimension two to the L, you see two to the L and um, and so physicists would say half integer spins or spin half uh, particles so they can be up or down. And you write the Hamiltonian poly matrices, which everybody, yeah, quantum computation is in the title of the conference. I don't have to explain what a poly matrix is. So it's operators on the space. Okay, so the object in physics is to diagonalize this, which you can't do explicitly, but you can say a lot about. It. Yeah. What is delta? Oh, delta is saying, thank you. Delta is just a parameter. Okay, so if, if I said delta to one, <laughs> this thing would have an SU2 symmetry. 
and that's called the Heisenberg chain. So XXE in the spectacularly unimaginative naming of physicists. So you just add this other parameter. So Heisenberg would then would be XXX. And then, and so you can guess what happens if I change that coupling that's called XY. But I guess that, that one, uh, one inside parenthesis is that. Yeah, I put that there for technical reasons. That's just a constant. Yeah. So I've just shifted the Hamiltonian by a constant. You'll see okay. the next, next thing why I bothered to do that. Yeah. So X, Y, Z, because the, the parameters on X and Y are the yeah. same. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, usually people, if you do that, you write J sub X, J sub Y, and J sub Z. But then the convention for X, X, Z is to call it delta. But yeah. That's all. So it's just a parameter. The physics depends on in an interesting way. And yeah, the, I'll, I'll mention a little bit at the very end how the physics depends on, on delta. Good. Yeah. Thank completely. Otherwise, this, this will go away. So please keep. Please keep asking. Yeah, and of course there's a language barrier. So again, if I say something bizarre, just just ask. It may be intended to be, so maybe not. Um, okay, so here I'm going to rewrite this. This is a la temporally, but it's not what tem temporally did the same sort of thing, but not exactly what I'm doing here. This is different. So I'm going to write this in just some way. So I do something. This this bit so far is completely trivial. I'll just say, I call that, those two things, I'll call that operator S, and I'll call that one P. So this, this thing here is just a completely trivial rewriting. I've done nothing of interest so far. Okay, now I start to do something interesting. I say, well, what algebra do these operators satisfy? It turns out they satisfy a pretty simple algebra. Obviously, they commute if the indices are pretty far, uh, more than uh, more than one apart, they commute is easy to check. But then when they're close together, see, well, P, Y, Y put the one in and Y that. So that square, it's a P is a projector. So it squares to P. You can see these two are orthogonal to each other. Um, S isn't a projector, but you squared and you get one minus P. Those are all trivial to check. This one, these two are nice and simple. They may take a few minutes to do. Okay, so a la Temperin Lieb, I've re written it this way. Um, and well, the point is like temporary leave, I can show that now other models do the same thing. But one interesting thing, side comment for this conference, but for some people, um, a key uh, equation in integrability is called the Yang-Baxter equation. And uh, the fact uh, models integrable, if you show these operators satisfy a certain equation, the Yang-Baxter equation, you all know this, uh, well, Maybe you all know this is, it's a limit of the third, uh, sorry, the third right of Meister move is a limit of the Yang-Baxter equation. But anyway, that's the thing for the inner ball. But the point is, I don't ever, the moment I write this down, I can find a solution to the Yang-Baxter equation that only depends on these properties. And that was, uh, I thought we had discovered that, but it turns out Ziad Maserani, who was their student, I think, and my postdoc at some point, uh, uh, showed that a long time. All right, so now let me tell you about, okay, so that's part one, that's the algebra. So no, obviously I wouldn't have told you if it weren't useful and here's the useful bit. Um, all right, so I can find another model pretty easily and people did, so all these people had basic mucked around in various interesting ways and most of what part two is was not known maybe in the fashion I'm gonna tell you, but, but was known. These are, these are quote equivalences between models. So if you take this model, this is, so if you look at it a little carefully, it's two icing chains. So to avoid confusion with the X, the big X's for the poly matrices, I wrote this because it's a different Hilbert space. So you take two icing chains and then you couple in a zigzag fashion. So those of you who know how icing chains work, will recognize this, th this thing flips the spin on each site, standard icing. We have a nearest neighbor interaction along the chain, notice it's J minus one and J plus one. And then we have uh, an interaction around each triangle that couples the two chains. So it's a Hamiltonian, but it's, it's, uh, it's uh, again, a few minutes to check that if I write this, is, this bit is S, that's P, it satisfies exactly the same algebra. I belabor this for a second because there's a moral already. The XXE chain, if you look at it, it has a U1 symmetry because I can do rotations between X and Y. That's fine. It's use, very useful for lots of reasons. This thing does it. And it, 
I'll, I'll get back to the UN symmetry. This thing doesn't have a UN symmetry. More precisely, it doesn't have a UN symmetry. Well, no, it doesn't have a UN symmetry, period. It just doesn't. So our equivalent model, equivalence is, that's why I have to put it in quotes. Symmetries of these two models, even though they satisfy the same algebra, is not the same. And uh, it doesn't have on-site symmetry, or it doesn't have it doesn't have on-site U1 symmetry, or it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Symmetry. It doesn't have U1. It has something related to U1 symmetry that I'll get back to way at the end. But yeah, no, it just doesn't have a U1 symmetry. Period. There's no U1. You look at the even if you don't know anything about symmetry, you know you could look at just diagonalize the Hamiltonian and look at you know how the degeneracies, and you would see the degeneracies in this U1. And don't don't fit any you ones. So there's another one that I'm not going to use much, but I did want to flash to show there's uh, another one. You can take uh, three state pots. I, I I don't. Yeah, let me just flash that for those of you who uh, I'll pause momentarily for those of you who know something about pots models. Um, I mainly put this in to say there's another way to realize this algebra in terms of domain walls satisfying the chromatic algebra. So I wrote a couple of papers with Slava Krushko a while ago um, discussing how you could say interesting things about the chromatic polynomial in terms of algebraic relations. Again, very much using fusion category stuff. And this model um, is this particular example of the chromatic algebra. It's at, at, at Q equals three, the Q of Q, Q state pots model. And so again, you can do this algebra I wrote down entirely graphically, not in the usual way. So I wanted to just flash that for people who are interested in such things and then after you can ask me about. But okay, it's a second model that satisfies the same algebra. That's what we need today. All right, so now finally, I'll get back to the fusion category. I said there were uh, four models. So we've got three so far, XXE and these two others. Now to get the last one though, and the, the one having to do with the Rydberg blockade, like I told you about, does now require fusion. So this, ironically, is I think the slide I need to explain the least, I hope, uh, but someone please ask if I, if I go through this too quickly. So the fusion algebra is SU2 level four, which is of course known. And um, so the fusion rules that, I, that I'm interested in um, are just take fusion with spin one. So you've got uh, five objects, the identity and physicists label these objects by, by convention zero, one half. Oh, sorry, I didn't write it down there. Zero, one half, one, three halves, and two. That's our convention for labeling these objects. Um, and then the fusion rules written in terms of that are familiar from SU2. Um, the physicists, again, you have to tell them, oh, there's a truncation. But again, everybody in this room probably knows that. Um, but this is a nice way to write these rules that will is useful in coding. So I can write these rules. So, so the, what these two pictures mean, these two pictures give a visual way, a diagram um, uh, to, to, to label fusion spin one. So all, all the rule says is it, you have an edge, you have uh, one, uh, uh, sorry, one node in this diagram for each object, and then an edge if the two are related by spin one. So one half times one is one half plus three halves. So there's one edge going from one half to itself, likewise for three halves, and there's one connected. Now zero, one, two. So already one interesting thing is when you're fusing with spin one, this decomposes into two connected bits. So when you fuse the spin one with the identity, of course, you just get one, um, two with one. And so those are the rules. This is a fusion rule, just a picture to get most of the fusion rules of SU2 level four or O3 level two, if you just want to do that bit. Um, and so I, I, I flashed previously in the slide. So we know from a variety of reasons, the chromatic algebra, that this algebra, I right. so I, 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 I developed it just by writing down the XXE algebra, but the fusion category gives you uh, ways of realizing uh, objects that satisfy that algebra of S and P. And in particular, let me explain how to do that. So uh, so, so this goes back way to the 80s again, and all the stuff in those days, they were called uh, RSOS models or IRF for interaction around a face. Now they're sometimes called Enion chains. But again, so let's think of configurations along a line for a moment. We do a 2D, 2D lattice or just a line for a moment. 
And so what the rule is, okay, the allowed degrees of freedom are these objects. And objects are allowed to be next to each other if uh, if the two objects are related by fusion by spin one. This is my definite, I'm defining a model with these properties. I'm using the fusion rules to define a model. And the Hilbert space of this model, if you wish, is then defined by the rules given by this. So please ask if if, if that's not clear. If it's spanned by allowable configuration. Yeah, so it's spanned by allowable configuration. So this is one of them. You know, I start at one, you know, and then go to two, you know, and, and so if I if I wrote it right, I, I have made mistakes in the past. You can check me. The point is anytime they're adjacent in this line here. So then all the Hilbert space, you know, paths on the Bertelli diagram if you know if you know so two is never adjacent to zero. That's all we have to check. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. What? You just have to check two is not adjacent to zero. Yes, exactly. And uh, two is not adjacent to zero. Oh, or or, uh, or, to itself. or to itself. Yeah, or to itself. Right. And then that defines. It. So now our Hilbert the the a, ba a set of basis states for our Hilbert space is defined by all such configurations. So that's so now having if you make that definition, then uh, a, a set of stuff going back to the eighties tells you there's some nice Hamiltonians you can define on this Hilbert space. Um, and that's one of them. But before I write down that Hamiltonian, say, well, now we can get to our Rydberg thing. So with these rules, so, okay, Rydberg, remember, I said, well, you pick some lattice, and then you say forbid nearest neighbors is the simplest thing to do. Um, but here we're going to do is something slightly different. Okay, so now I'm going to take a ladder and I allow particles on the ladder, but I identify then an empty rung on the ladder with one. I empty, I identify, say, the bottom, a particle on the bottom rung with two, and I am identify one on the top rung with zero. Okay, so it's, I'm now just giving you a picture that satisfies the same rules. If you now think that what's going on is now since uh, two can't be next to two, you can't have two particles there, but two can't be next to zero, so I can't have two particles there either. So what it means is it's one particle per square. And if you think about, so this is my ladder here, and if I have a Rydberg blockade, I forbid all occupancy. Again, the experimentalists really honestly can do this. Um, uh, then this would correspond to the tuning, the radius to do that. So good, any questions? So that's, we've used the category to define First, a Hilbert space. Well, with these rules, yeah. You're, you're, you haven't used the category structure, just the fusion rules. Just the fusion rules, right, thank you. Next slide, we get to the, we use the, thank you, yeah. The reason why I did this, because then when you pull the full-blown category, you can get a Hamiltonian with nice properties. And the point is you build that from the item potents, the projectors of the category. Those involved. So you all know you have various, you can do it graphically, but you can do it just in, in terms of the state sum. So you don't, you can do it in terms of the heights. So the heights are the degrees of freedom that would come if you did. <laughs> so you can define this. So I, that I'm skipping all that because many people know more about the details, but this one, you, you have to just trust me. This is possible. This is what Dave and Roger and I explained in our paper. Um, for I, you, one way of doing it is via the state so yeah i think there are other like twisted versions of this rep like i would call this you know that's three so there's other twisted versions do they work too probably yeah um the, yeah one of the things you know because we've done a lot of these and and a question i don't know the answer to is you know yeah you can do twisted things and like that and in some cases we check and from the you you, you lose the twisting the lattice model is the same thing but that's most definitely not a theorem. In fact, I bet it's not true. If you find the right example, you can see the twisted versions and all that differ in some really meaningful and interesting way. I've just have not, not, not yet found an example of it. This, I would guess, probably, it might tell you something useful, but it probably won't be radically different. That's a guess, but, but yeah. No, we're definitely worth checking. Good. Yeah. Okay, so this is what the category buys you, and I'm, I'm not going to show you how that works, but it works. 
Um, and so it gives you a Hamiltonian with nice properties, in particular, it gives you a Hamiltonian that satisfies that SP algebra I showed before, which said gives you an integrable model. So this Hamiltonian, which let's go through. So if I combine these combinations here, so I make these combinations, linear combinations of T is a particle on the top rung, the thing I called two, or no, zero before. B, a particle on the bottom rung, which is B. And because the, the of one particle per square, um, you can take this linear combination without messing up the constraints. So, so that's one nice thing about taking that extra constraint. Anyway, in Hamilton, it's, it's not every term you write down, but it's most of the simple terms you could write down. So you can um, create or annihilate these things. Again, there's no, you, no particle number conservation. So this one annihilates or creates a particle just with the same amplitude on the top or bottom rung. Um, this one is a next nearest neighbor interaction because we don't allow we don't allow nearest neighbors, so you can get a next nearest neighbor interaction. And this, if I write in the plus minus space, this corresponds to swapping you know, plus plus to minus minus or plus minus to minus plus. Um, and then this is another <laughs> nearest neighbor. Interaction. So it is fine tuned, but then the payoff it's integrable. So what 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 is required? This is pretty generic. I don't. There's other terms you could add, but I don't think they'll change the physics um, any very much or at all. Um, but what's not generic is the fact that all the all these couplings are there, and so delta again the parameter. So one key. Let me let me make one comment. The difference between temporally leave when you you can do temporally leave for the x x e chain. That was they did that, but there the parameter delta. Uh, translates to Q, the quantum group parameter in that language. And so the parameter delta itself is tangled up in the algebra, which makes why quantum groups are so rich. And yeah, Bear has spent years dealing with the complications of, of understanding that. So this is much simpler. Delta here is just a parameter that doesn't have anything to do with the algebra. So that's, yeah. So I guess you've said this in principle, could probably be realized experimentally. Yeah. So is it an accident that it's IRL in <laughs> real life? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe in my head, that's a, I'm going to use this. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I will credit you for, uh, no, I, it, 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 it's clearly the stars have aligned and uh, yeah. <laughs> I swear to God. Uh, Brilliant. All right. No, good. This is why I give talks. So I can learn um, and again, to have, uh, reiterate a point made, again, there's no U1 symmetry in this. There's just uh, Z2 cross Z2. But I'll uh, I'll say a little bit about the model. Okay, so that's the model and all sorts of nice stuff uh, happens. Um, and in particular, so, so it doesn't stop at the integrability. So I think that what I said there is defining integral models whose algebras that goes back to the 80s, all sorts of beautiful work. But the new bit that I've, at least I think it's pretty new for StatMac is um, these non-invertible symmetries. Remember, I did talk about those a while ago. Um, those things, uh, those things um, allow you to map between all four of those. In particular, I have a commutative map. So uh, I, I'm only going to be able to do this schematically, but I, I will try and give you some detail on how these are. So all, all four models, I mean, we, you can explicitly write down the maps. You can look at Louisa, my paper, and the maps are explicitly written down between all of these things. And in fact, this diagram commutes. So if you go this way and that way, you get the same thing, which is useful for a variety of reasons. Um, and the Hamiltonians commute, quote, commute in the following sense. I have an XXE Hamiltonian and act on some vector space. Um, but then I have uh, another model, the zigzag ladder say, that I showed first, and different Hilbert space. Um, and it's got a Hamiltonian. But the point is it commutes if you act with this non-invertible mapping um, and then use the Hamiltonian, it get the same answer. <laughs> So the same answer could be zero, though. That's the non-invertibility. And so that's, so if you go there and you go back again, what you see is you don't get it. So this is, I said, these things are non-invertible. So I go from XXE to there. I come back and say, write everything up. But you see, you don't quite go there. You, you have one plus the configuration with all spin flips. So if you start on a configuration that's odd under this combination, so, so where the eigenvalue of F is minus one, odd under spin flip. 
that this K just annihilates it. So it's mapping only half the Hilbert space. Now then, this is where the twisting, that's why I say probably in, a, in my ad hoc fashion, I got it, but maybe not. So you can then say, ah, but if I take a twisted sector, I change the boundary conditions in XXC, I then can get the other sector. So you can find uh, by just trial and error, I can get from any sector in here to some sector in there, but the cost might be some kind of twisted boundary conditions. So uh, this F commutes with the XXZ plan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, right. So it's just a spin flip. And you, if you remember, um, all those things were bilinear. So, so this is flipping all the spins yeah. at once. So yeah, that's that's a symmetry. And um, so, so this, and um, so again, some of these things were known schematically, but no, uh, even even people had not interpreted what I wrote down as a paid ladder, but people had actually written down that Hamiltonian. But I think until we did it, no one had ever just kind of written this whole nice structure. And the category um, doesn't give you everything because, uh, you know, this three state any fair amount, yeah, has to do with rep S3. And so there's probably, no, not probably, there is some way of mapping, but it, that that's more work. I was going to ask, what are the other fusion rules, so to speak, amongst these these maps, right? So yeah, uh, I I hope I wrote them down. There's a if not, ask. The, I don't think I wrote them all down. There's a table in our paper, and I'll I'll try and drag that up at the end, or I can just show you after. Okay. Yeah. So there, we we know them all. I I'll show some more of them. I can't remember. I don't think I showed all of them though. I should have put the table in the talk. So yeah, well, next time I will put the table in the talk. Yeah. So how do you think about the fact that the symmetries don't match up? Uh, it's it, it, the, the, as because these maps are always sector by sector, and so for example, the point is, so notice what happens here. You know, we we only map uh, configurations that are odd under. So it's already that's why you see the the, the U one is going to be trashed, right? Because spin flip and the U one, you know, uh, so spin flip sort of flips the U one charge to minus itself. So if I'm only taking the positive, so it's like this yeah. map breaks the symmetry. Yeah. So breaks the symmetry. Yeah. So the map breaks the symmetry in sort of an obvious way, just by saying it's zero on some symmetry sectors, and then you know. it's been like these situations where like you can get a map by gauging. Yeah. But then you might have like two symmetry groups with a mixed denominator. Yeah. So yeah. You gauge one, you break yeah. the symmetry of the other. Yeah. I think mean, all this I believe can be phrased in the language of anomalies, which is the language du jour and. Uh, in particle in the string theory community now. So, and, and it, 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 I think that often is a useful way. And, and, and yeah, we did everything in ad hoc because I'm very lowbrow and I like to see it all, but there's, there's a Frank Verstrada and company wrote a paper where it much more is, puts on bigger structures than ours. And I think like the fact that this diagram commute, which so we just checked by, it's not that hard. You just write them all out and you check that it commutes, but you know, they have a more, that a way of, of seeing why that is. And then, yeah, and then you can start to make contact with how all these symmetries, invertible and non-invertible, you know, coexist. And and yeah, and the anomalies come exactly for this reason. Things things don't commute and then you mod out by something that doesn't commute with something else. And, and yeah, and so that's, yeah, good. Okay, so... Um, all right. Okay, good. I still have a little time. So let me now, so now this all, I will, I, I said I'm mostly doing the, the explicit example, but now I, I'm going to try and say a little about what Dave and Roger and I did and the big structure and where a little bit about where these maps come from and just how to define them, and which I hope is useful for you. So let me, this is more or less reiterating what I said, but that's it. that was an hour ago. Um, not quite 45 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> useful to re say it. So, um, so what a topological defect is, <clears throat> is again, so this is space. Think in a 2D classical model instead of 1D quantum model, but it's all formally, it all ends up being basically the same. Um, so you got one theory here. You can think of the icing model at low temperature. You can think of it as XXE. Whatever. You got a theory here. That's the, the yellow. And then we have one of these topological defects. And in there, there's another theory, so the Rydberg chain. And in between them, um, there exists 
a topological defect. So this that's not obvious even from the algebra, even though I show they satisfy the same algebra, we can construct a defect such that the partition function is independent for this combined thing where we have theory one here, defect and theory two, um, is it independent of any local deformation. So I'll, def I'll define precisely what, what, what I mean by this partition function. Again, schematically wanted to show that again. And again, like I said before, if we were doing some time evolution, they would have to then commute with whatever you do in your time evolution, a Hamiltonian or a transfer matrix. And again, to emphasize these operators are not typically not invertible. And again, to emphasize something, a never imposing integrability. And there's many examples that are not integrable. These things still exist. And the fusion categories do it. So again, I, I'm basically just reiterating the first part of the talk before I go into detail. So here's one thing I didn't say before. With, for, when you build these lattice models using the category, um, the types of topological defects are labeled by objects in the Drinfeld Center. Um, something that's confused us and we don't have a general thing is um, there are more objects in the Drinfeld Center than defects that we've been able that that we know because different objects in the Turnfeld center uh, correspond to the same topological defects. So it's again sort of this somehow losing information when you use it for the or not losing information, I should say, just distinctions that are important when you're talking to the category or not do not seem relevant there. Um, and so there, so that again we can build the defects in the same way. So this was basically just a review I said a while ago, but now I'm going to give a little more detail. Yeah. So do you have control over which objects in the principal center you get, or is there some explanation, or you just realize kind of practically you can? No, you realize for any object, for what I'm about to tell you in detail, any object in the Drinfeld Center will give you these. The comment I just made before is sometimes <laughs> there are different objects in the Drinfeld Center, but equivalent defects. But any object and in Drinfeld Center. Equivalence in the defects is some equivalence in the Drinfeld Center. I, yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. This is just practical when we write out the weight, the the weights and all that. For so you just see, <laughs> well, there's signs and things like that. I should say all the examples we have worked out. You can say, all right, well, that's just like a gauge choice. And so then it probably, as you say, probably is something in the Drinfeld Center. So, oh yeah, because once we've reduced it to this. It's just some gauge choice, but that's not a proof. And I would much rather that be not true. But but that's yeah. So that's I should say that's an experimental observation that, that not a not a proof. Okay. Uh, but hey, uh, yeah. On the previous slide, would you express your Hamiltonian as rule? Because these models are technically different, right? The Hamiltonians yeah. are technically yeah. different. No, they're absolutely different models. So, so it, can you could you go two slides back, please? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, so here you're saying, for example, you can have Hamiltonian plus matrix that in defect commutes, but the both on the two sides, the Hamiltonian is different. Yeah, that's right. So the way you uh, we think about it is that relation that we've done, you you know, so so say let's just draw our defect core. In fact, I'll, I'll I'll draw some defect horizontally just to make it easy for a second. Okay, so I act with the Hamiltonian, act with the Hamiltonian, I then run the defect, which even can completely change the Hilbert space, but then I act with the new Hamiltonian on the new model. Uh -huh. And it's and, there's and, no arbitrariness. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And the, the point is, you'll get the same answer for the partition function no matter where I move, move this. So, and in particular, in this picture here, so now let's go back instead of doing the operator thing, do a thing. I can move this all the way to the boundary, or I can shrink it to nothing, and it doesn't change the answer. And I'll, I'll, I'll show a few more schematic pictures that maybe will. So, yeah. So, let me, I'll show a few more schematic pictures, but then please ask again if that. Thank you. And another unrelated question. So for some of these models, there exist parameters for which you will have lattice superfluid. Yeah. yeah. They have any significance. <laughs> Believe me, I know about that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, so any significance for algebraic structure? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, I think there's a yeah, I, I've never gotten super symmetry, lattice of supersymmetry to kind of coexist nicely with this um, because that doesn't seem to fit nicely. In the and that's again not a proof, just my failure to get it there. But no, that's a that's good really cool. yeah. No, I happily talk about that more because uh, that I spent a lot of time thinking about it. Good, good. yeah, hey, more. Oh. Uh, right, okay, that one. 
be whatever. Okay, so let me, uh, you know, I keep saying I'm going to define it. So let me once and for all, and for those of you who know what transfer matrix is, just tune out for two minutes, but then many of you maybe don't. Okay, so I, I, let's just do the square lattice. Let's do the 2D classical lattice model. So what we do is we have a bunch of degrees of freedom. So this, these, the zeros, ones, twos, the, rid, the, the, the things that come, objects in a category. So the, the way I've drawn the graph, the objects in the category I use to build all this um, are objects, and that's, I'm calling them heights here, and then they live on the vertices of the graph, and I'm just going to do the square lattice here. Okay, so those are the degrees of freedom. They take on certain values, say zero, one, two, we put in these rules, et cetera. Okay, so the way I define a vector space, like I said briefly, but I'll only draw it carefully, are just take all the heights living along some line, which in this case, I'll make this zigzag one. And the basis elements are all the things that I talked about before. And uh, so what the transfer matrix does, it's an operator in this vector space, but the elements of the, really in this way of writing, it's really is a matrix. Um, a matrix operator, linear operator on this vector space. And the way we label the things, but it, because I say it's local in the sense that I can write the matrix elements of this big matrix acting on this vector space in terms of a product of something local. And I draw it just as a picture. So it's this is a, what the square means is some number that depends on the four labels of the objects around each square. And then I take the product all along a whole zigzag row, and then that the elements of this depend on what these are. And then I keep going down. And so the partition function then, um, if you write it in this way, well, it's just the product <laughs> over all the faces of these numbers, and then you sum over all the allowed configurations. So exactly what you do in a state sum, you sum over the all allowed things with these weights, some numbers, that's what the category hands use these numbers. And if you want, you can write this. If I take periodic boundary conditions in this direction, um, then this is a trace of this operator to the R where there's R rows. So that is a two minute version of what a transfer matrix is, which I hope for those you didn't know enough to, to at least believe me. Um, and those who like quantum Hamiltonians, for the models that I defined, you can get a nice quantum Hamiltonian by taking a certain special limit, again, that gets built in to the definition of these weights that the category hands you. Uh, right, so here's how now we modify this. So that's just how you would define a model in the absence of defects. So the way we do defects, so say it takes this path. And so say... Um, this this is the path of my defect. Okay. And then, so what I do to define the defect in the setup is to crack open the lattice along the path of the defect. And then I put these special things into what this rectangle means. It's the weight, it's something weight depending on the four spins on the two sides of this. And these can live in a diff, these can live in one Hilbert space and this can live in another. There's no particular reason why, because it's a clue, you know, side one, side two. I mean, there's, and as long as the defect stretches, not going to talk today about what happens if you want to end them. So they have to stretch all the way to the edge of the system or, or if you're on a torus around the system. Um, and so this then, but the, um, so that's the definition of this. So then the, in the presence of a defect, the partition function you still have the, the weights that come from each square, the four heights, four objects around each square. Um, but then you have a product of these things along the defect. So the statement I kept making, it's invariant under deformations, is that this thing doesn't depend on which path I choose. I can deform the path in this, which is unbelievably non-obvious. I'll tell you a little bit how you show that it's true. But let me now, I kept talking about operators in space. So, so now this thing I mentioned quickly before. So if I want an operator, I stretch a defect horizontally. You know, I have it. So if I again go back to my more mundane picture, this, I can stretch a defect horizontally there and then think of it as an operator. That's what we call the defect creation operator, D. And I said already before, there's one of these defect uh, operators for every object in the Dredfeld center. And so there's a definition that I'll show you. But the key topological thing is now you need these defects to satisfy this property. And 
the sum is crucial for reasonable explainer sex. So, so here's again the weight of just the original model, no defect. And then these are the weights of the defect. And it says, well, basically you drag the defect to the other side, you get the same thing. But the crucial thing, there's a sum over this. This is an equality of the partition function. It is not an equality of configurations. It's only an equality when you do this uh, so in the state sum, when you have to do the state sum. And just like in the state sum, you have to, you, it's only an equality, a topological invariant, when you sum over everything. So this defect is only topological when you sum over everything. So that's the state. And then you drag that one through. Um, and if you want it, uh, there's a, a, a language closer to the categories that, that, that Frank Restrada's group and company do. Um, and uh, and draw this relation that way, and they call it the pulling through condition. But so let me just show how this, so this shows now that this defect creation operator I defined on the previous slide commutes with the transfer matrix um, of this model that I defined also with two slides previous. All right, so this is now, so this is my picture of, a so now I'm gonna act, um, I guess, what am I doing? Yeah. Top to bottom, so I act with the transfer matrix, and then act with the defect creation there. But I can keep using these things and I can pull. And as, again, as long as at the partition function level, this gives me the same thing at the end. But you can, but these conditions apply a stronger condition is that if I just move this as an operator statement, this defect creation operator commutes with. But again, we're summing over everything in the middle. So it's still not configuration by configuration. It's acting with two operators. So these, if you want to think of these operators as matrices, these two matrices can be matrices. The weather blocks. Yeah. Uh, do you allow your defect line to cross itself? Yeah, hold on. Yes. We'll get there. Soon. Um, all right, so, so here's the answer for the category. Again, since I don't have a lot of time, this is the tetrahedral symbol. So in our paper, we did it for categories. That, what's, I can never remember. Categories that have tetrahedral symbols, which what, there's a name for that, spherical something. Uh, the, uh, anyway, so that's, that's the answer. So literally the category hands you those weights I use to define the model, both the bulk ones there. And the proof, if you don't believe to arrive, well, there's sort of three. You can believe, just believe that the construction works, which it does, um, or you can actually then prove. So the pictures to prove those those relations I showed, these are the pictures. So you, you draw these and you just do the manipulations and then it's true. And again, emphasize, even though that defect commutation relation looks a bit like the Yang-Baxter equation, it's a weaker, it's weaker than the Yang-Baxter equation. So you can have this without having interoperability. Um, just let me, yes, yeah, since this, pro, I'm not, I don't know how people care about the icing model, but let, let me just flash this quickly. Um, this, so this is the answer with the category answer for the icing model. Yeah, because physicists like thing, I remember a well-known physicist getting mad at me because I was so schematic and happily I had this slide. So now I leave this in. This is really an answer. So in icing, what happens, there's two kinds of defects. So this is how I write down icing. So I'm gonna write icing in a funny way. It's on the square lattice, but I'm, I, well, in these pictures, but I'm going to put the icing spin up or down only on every other site. And if, if you know categories and you all do, um, the point is uh, it fits into the structure I gave before. If on the other sites is the sigma. So up and down are the identity and the psi and the other ones are the sigma. So, so that's why we do it this way. Um, anyway, so, but in terms of stat mac, you say, okay, well, just ignore the sigma sites and this is one or psi or up or down. And so we have some weights here. So that's not in the category. That's some local information. We give it some weight called KX because whether the spins are the same in the X direction and KY, for example. And so now what a spin flip defect, it says that you cross one of this, these lines here that I've been drawing all along, and it just flips the value of the spin. So that's the weight for this. It just says you have a plus on one side of the defect, you have a minus, so that's a spin flip defect. In the, in the isomers, that's associated with psi. Um, but then the interesting one becomes the defect associated with sigma, which is then um, instead you have here, okay, so on one side of the defect, you have the spins living on the starred site. So let's start over here. 
but then and there but then in the it shifts then the non-zero weights are when the spin the one or size or the plus or minus are across the rectangle here so what you see when you draw this bigger picture i've shifted the spins from one sub lattice to the other and that's what i see well but this now tells you a particular weight. And so then these things are, um, the partition function in the presence of this has low temperature icing on one side, high temperature on the other, but the partition function is the same no matter where I draw this. So that's what all the category stuff buys you. So now you can do all sorts of fun things. So I'll just sort of blast through this quickly to show some, show some uh, I'll get schematic again. I think I've mostly ended the talk. Yeah, sure, please. Uh, if I if I have this um, ising and then dual ising, um, if the whole system is on like porous or something, you can't completely shrink like the dual ising to zero. Yeah, I can. Yeah, that's that's yeah. In fact, oh, that's what schematically is a D five. Yeah, okay, okay. that's right. I was worried about the D five. Yeah. And the other thing you can do is you can drag it out to the boundary. But there's a scalar that okay. Yeah. So the other thing I could do here is yeah. So I can I can do two things. Yeah. One well, the one I drew is so I can start with this defect and I can actually shrink it to nothing. But it gives me this factor D. So it relates the partition function with no defect to the partition function with the defect. But then even more interestingly, um, I can then say I could drag the defect to the outside. I've got a boundary. So now there's an operator acting on the boundary. So then you glue it to the boundary that changes the boundary conditions. And so I have an equality between the partition function of one model, so the low temperature icing, is equal to the partition function of high temperature icing, but with different boundary conditions. Change is free to fix. If, you know. And it gives you the ratio. And so this gives you an exact computation, an exact lattice computation of the ratio of the, the G-fact, the Affleck Ludwig G-fact. Squared. Yeah, yeah. No, it's really miraculous. Yeah, so you can derive the Affleck, I think. You can derive the Affleck Ludwig G factors exactly from the lattice. So they're, those are exact numbers in the lattice model, not just the conform field there. Good, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if you uh, look at this square and apply one of your two identities that's satisfied by your uh, defect equations, yeah, you can uh, switch one edge to the other three edges or, yeah, or, that's right. or conversely. But if I apply that relation to this square, you will get uh, Yeah, uh, so so this this requires a little more than what I showed in the slide. So yeah, so I do that and then I get sort of two defects on one. So I guess that answers partially your earlier question. Yeah. I get two defects on one, but I can then just treat the two defects as one. Okay. And what you see in this case is it's no defect. Yeah. And um uh, well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it's actually not no defect. Yeah. So that right. So there's an additional calculation that I suppressed to 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 see that. Um. And in fact, yeah. Good. That was perfect setup for the next one. So if I take, oops. Um. If I take two defects and fuse them together, just like I said, um, I uh, don't get. Nothing. Well, in the case of a spin flip defect, I just do two spin flips. Obviously, you flip the spin twice, nothing happens. But when I do this duality defect, it gives me one plus there. And so the fusion rules of the defects then are guaranteed by this setup to obey the fusion rules of the corresponding objects in the category. So so schematically, if I did the partition function, high temperature icing, low temperature icing, high temperature icing, I can then few, you know, move these defects, use this, and it's the same as the partition function of icing plus the spin. And that's an exact equality. And again, you see this is not invertible. The... Uh... So, all right, so let me quickly show you can now branch and you can make them branch and fuse. Again, the weights of this are defined by the category. And then you, you see the defects themselves satisfy F moves corresponding to the corresponding objects. So that's, that's you have to show this, but it all works. And that's what, yeah, David Roger. 
And uh, you know, then basically you can even ignore the lattice to draw pictures. Um, last, yeah, last of the flash throughs. Um, uh, you can put this on the torus and this is a famous relation of Ising model partition functions that you can derive by wrapping these defects around the torus. The old way you would use spin structures, so the, the defects basically are this a version of the spin structure. No, no fermions met necessary, but of course equivalent to a different way of thinking about it. And you can write down the modular transformations and then diagonalize them so you can compute exact uh, results for scaling dimensions of operators uh, if, if those operators exist in a field theory. Okay, so good. I, I will wind down now, but let me just wanted to just uh, say how this fit into the ladder that I advertised before. So again, I drew this picture, XXE at the bottom, these other two models, and then there, this turns out to be the nicest way to define these maps explicitly. Um, and again, so uh, so what you, so now it's, so now you get symmetries from this. And basically uh, what happens is if I take this operator D and then map to there, so this is the operator associated with the spin half object. It takes you to a different theory. <clears throat> that's the odd spins. I didn't say that when I introduced it, but that's the odd spins. And so you do it back and then the fusion rules tell you, well, you have to do that. And so this object is non-trivial, but this is a real symmetry, but it's non-invertible because of that from the category. So it's a non-invertible symmetry. So it's a, it's, it's a self-duality, but again, in the sense that it doesn't duality, self maybe quote duality because it doesn't map. It doesn't do it twice and you don't get back. And something I found really neat, and the way practically to write it, so, you know, I spent a lot of time writing this out and having some matrix way of doing it. And then finally, we realized, oh, uh, so the way to get this duality is actually do this map, and then just, this has an S3 symmetry. So you do the Z3 symmetry there, and then you map back, and that's this duality. So uh, nature takes advantage of this. Yeah. Do all O O D M K? Do they all together form some category? Yeah. Well, this. So this is what Frank Verstrada and Lawrence Luton is the first author, and Frank Verstrada and Crew. Yeah, they have a bimodule category, and I believe they certainly believe, and I think they showed it. It's hard. It gets technical, and I, I don't understand all, but at least the claim is, and I I believe it. Um, that yes, this whole thing now you can get from by going to some bigger structure and these all fit in there um, but yeah at the end is that a d twiddle i guess I... On the yes thank you yeah that's d twiddle yeah sorry yeah good yeah 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 no no sorry i just said that last time I said, oh that's really cool and then i drank too much so yeah thank you yeah Maybe a bit more technical question. Can you show again uh, um the, the picture for the six day symbols that you have yeah yeah sure uh, Sorry, this is not yeah, right. okay, so this is for the junction. So you have to put in a triangular defect, but again, you look at, there's six things there. What else could it be other than a tetrahedral symbol and other than getting the normalization right it is? Um, you always yeah. have these six inputs and then some of them are changed yeah. from like the standard input to defect input. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. And it, you know, it's a sort of miracle, yeah. When you write it out this way, it always, there's, if you write it on the right way, there's just six. And then again, what else could it be? But then you go check and it, it, it really does work. No, we really check. It satisfies the F move. Yeah. So again, you know, Dave is fantastic at this stuff. So he really went through the, I, I, I do the lowbrow. All right, let's pick a model and check that it works. And Dave then does the more abstract thing. But we all, we are happily in it. Um, okay, this is conference is done. So let me just, I'm just going to, I can skip the physics. That's okay. And then just put conclusions. Thank you. <laughs>